California Highway 1. The narrow, two-lane Pacific Coast Highway winds high above giant sea-sloshed rocks with little alcove beaches. An east coast. Hippie couple renting a red farmhouse across the road showed us the anchored rope that locals used to get down the cliffs. The prospect of trusting this rope for the steep descent halted me cold, but seeing the big mustachioed man take hold of it and lean back from the cliff with all his weight spurred me to flip off fear and step forward. Charlie quipped, No, let me be the hero. As he reached for the rope, his smile and a glint in his eye contacted a deeper part of my consciousness, and I felt simultaneously thrilled and embarrassed to be busted, displaying bravado. I was an undercover tomboy. I believed I could do almost anything the guys could do, but... I would never have made such a claim. On the beach, we stripped off our shoes and socks, rolled up sleeves and pant legs. We spent the afternoon by ourselves, searching for natural treasures, soaking up the faint warmth, and watching the sun sink into its own red lake. I lost most of the experience in a blinding preoccupation with my skin. My legs were ugly, so pale you could see the red and blue vessels. On the Southern California beaches, where surfers ruled and all respectable people were tan, a teenage friend had once hollered, Lynn, where are you? You blend in with the sand. I took it seriously. It was a matter of status to be dark. A matter of popularity. I had blistered and lobstered myself in the attempt. The only melanin I seemed to have was in spots. As a new teen, I'd been embarrassed to learn through a magazine ad of a skin cream that would remove ugly blotches, freckles, and flaws. Another page advertised the glossy, bronzed bodies of people using quick tanning cream. The results on me were freakish. The dye turned me iodine orange, and I spent about a month looking like the victim of a violent car crash. Charlie suddenly told Mary to look at my legs. I shunned him. He told her, look at all the colors. I covered my legs and wanted to hide. I was angry. He adopted it. Haven't those legs served you? Haven't they carried you everywhere you wanted to go since you got up on them? And I reluctantly considered this. It was true that I took them for granted. They were functionally more than adequate. I'd been a dancer. He said... Neither of you know how perfect you are. I wanted to believe him, but hid the thought quickly so as not to be taken for a fool. Nobody else had ever said that to me before. Mary didn't seem suspicious of Charlie. Not that we talked about it. Charlie did most of the talking, by our preference. He made observations and sometimes told us stories about the prison on McNeil Island in Washington State, where he had spent the majority of his last federal sentence. 
He was 24 when a judge in Los Angeles sentenced him to 10 years for trying to cash a check he won in a poker game. He sounded blasé about it, a little surprised that this rinky-dink $37.50 check had gotten him so much time. That first week, we drove to the peninsular town of Mendocino for groceries and so Mary could rent a post office box. Her parents and Charlie's parole officer had to have a point of contact. Architecturally, Mendocino, like San Francisco, was a New England transplant, a replica of its early inhabitants' origins, with both fine Victorian homes and patched wood shacks. By remnant and recent renewal, it had the look of a sepia photograph of many 19th century Western towns, with a Cracker Barrel grocery, a leather workshop, the original timbered hotel, and a garage, once a livery stable and blacksmiths. Some of the streets were still lined with boardwalks, no doubt because, before asphalt, they became muddy and puddled. I could see the women's long skirt dragging in the dirt, right then. In 1967, pioneer skirts were back in fashion, along with fringed buckskins, boots, high-necked lace blouses, and other antique garments that had been stored for years in attics and trunks and were showing up in secondhand stores. I waited outside while Mary and Charlie went into the grocery. Nothing had been built along one side of the street to ruin the view of the grassy promontory to its cliffs and the sea. Two wind-wild horses frisked there, up to their fetlocks in spring grass. Their flying manes before the ocean looked like the illustrations and horse books I had checked out of the library while I was in elementary school. Most of my classmates' parents, like mine, had come to Los Angeles in the 40s from other parts of the country or world for the job opportunities. NASA and the aircraft companies drew them, the military got a big batch, and all of the human service professions needed people. One of my classmates' parents was a gardener, another a homicide detective, a third an astronaut. My dad worked for Northrop Aircraft as an aeronautical engineer, designing planes for the military. My mother looked after him, me, my younger brother, and later a sister. She was good at it. She'd been obliged to quit high school at the age of 14 to help with farm work and the raising of younger siblings. She had never gone back for the requisite papers to qualify for professional employment, but she was proud of my father's position and education. He earned all of the household money, and he controlled it. She wouldn't have thought to have it any other way. But my father's job was not secure when there was no need for the product. During the 50s, after the Korean War, his company periodically announced pending layoffs, and he, being one of the younger engineers, bore the news home with cynical jokes and our future in the poorhouse. He was smiling, but real fear was in his eyes, and although he never lost his job, he desperately strove to secure it by taking advanced math, physics, business, and language courses. He would just get home from work and sit down to eat with us 
when it was time for him to be hurrying back to the car for the hour-long drive to the university. On nights when he stayed at home, he isolated himself so that he could study. He was very serious and wanted no interruptions. Charlie was talking with a stranger on his way out of the store. When we walked down the street to view the town, he spoke with half the people who looked in his direction. Many replied as if resuming conversation with a friend. A couple of times when he spoke with young women, I felt illogically jealous, both of his directing his attentions elsewhere and of their apparent ease in the exchange. I didn't even look at most people for fear of invading their privacy. Privacy was a major concern of my parents, who were easily embarrassed. From the beginning, I was the odd show-off in the family. My father had pointed this out to me in a manner of scolding, even before I had started kindergarten. Actually, he was right. I didn't know how to ride a horse at the age of five, no matter how many times I'd seen it on TV. He was probably protecting me, but his reprimands made me tuck myself in like a hedgehog. On the roads through the woods to and from our cabin, Charlie explored. He was a safe driver, but whimsical, backing up or turning onto side roads to suit his curiosity, all while conversing, singing, or being silent, giving no hint of his purposes. Sometimes he read houses, speculating on their owners. These people have a lot of love. Probably got grandchildren that come up in the summer. These people are afraid. Look at all those locks. On a whim, he would jaunt up to the doors. At first, I couldn't believe he could be so sanguine. You could have dropped him anywhere on earth, and he'd have had an extraordinary experience. He said that in prison, he'd realized he could be free wherever he was. He told a story about being in the hole in Terminal Island. A warden had stopped to ask him why he never asked to get out. You know, he quoted the warden, if you acted right and asked me, you might get out of here early. Get out of where? Charlie asked him. Out of this penitentiary, the warden barked. What penitentiary? Charlie asked. Are you in a penitentiary? I'm not. I enjoyed watching and listening to Charlie, but balked when he tried to coax me into his enjoyment. I didn't know what I wanted. I couldn't go home. It hadn't been my real home for years. I wondered about my mother, brother, and sister, but we had been apart many times before. Mary made small dinners in the cabin while Charlie talked with the dog and then with his guitar. Private conversations venturing out on chords, repeating sequences, and fingering single strings. His body bowed over it, his face blank, as if listening to its confidences. Some of Charlie's original music was catchy, and some of it complex, with pivotal chords and key changes. The words were simple. Your home is where you're happy. It's not where you're not free. Your home is where you can be what you are. 
because you were just born to be. The notion that we might be born simply to experience existence was not mainstream thinking at the time. Anywhere you might wander, you could make that your home. And as long as you've got love in your heart, you'll never be alone. Hardly new, a little sappy, yet hopeful and timely, and I liked it a lot. But some of his phrases were embarrassingly vacuous. They'll show you their castles and diamonds for all to see. Redundant. Ridiculous. Nobody lives in castles. Bet they'll never show you their peace of mind. Because they don't know how to be free. True or not, those lyrics sounded faux folk and freedom to me. My English lit teacher would have snarled at them. One morning, for some reason, we left the car and took a ride to a wide lake or bay where one of Charlie's new acquaintances had a wooden rowboat that we pushed off the pebbled shore and paddled to the center of some spectacular coniferous scenery. As the sun lifted mist off the water, an otter floated by on its back, gnawing a grisly mollusk clutched between its paws. The day became hot and stunningly blue. Cool water slapping the sides of the boat as it rocked us. But I got sunburned and lost my book. It left in the car of the stranger who brought us. I was sorely disappointed and blamed Charlie because he clearly didn't sympathize. I didn't say anything. I just thought he was careless, arrogant, and obviously illiterate. A few days later, he surprised me with another copy of the same book. He'd seen it in someone's cabin and had simply asked for it. Mary was generous, providing me with shampoo and all of the necessities without making me feel in the least indebted to her. Charlie was considerate, deferential, almost salacious. I was flattered, but I didn't like it. I wasn't used to it. I liked him better when he was aloof. Your ego is a too much thing, was one of Charlie's prison compositions, with minor chords and an insinuating, snaky sound. He sang it to neighbors in the Red Farmhouse, but I knew it was really to me. I felt pulled to attention, personally attacked and disdainful of the peculiar lyrics. The expression, too much, dated it. Four or five years earlier, too much was common teen slang for amazement, delight, and even disgust. Everything was too much. Your ego is a too much thing. Your ego is a too much thing. It'll make you fool yourself. You'll think you're somebody else. Look out for the trouble it brings. You get afraid you're going to act like a clown. And you get mad when somebody puts you down. Your heart's a pumping and your paranoia's jumping. Your ego is a too much thing. When things are going just fine, your ego puts itself in a bind. Your certainty turns to doubt. Then you start flipping out and you ease on out of your mind. While singing, 
Charlie grazed me with the ego eye. This was a tete-a-tete. Something was definitely going on here. The East Coast couple had given us an open invitation to visit their farmhouse. Their hospitality and fascination with Charlie kept us coming back. The man and Charlie discussed music and most things mechanical, while the woman offered coffee and whatever she had baked or cooked. Other neighbors sometimes filled the house. One day, Charlie was telling a group of us about a 40-day stint in solitary confinement. When I got there, the guy in the next cell was whistling and banging a tin cup on the cement wall. Charlie demonstrated, whistling the United States Marine Corps anthem while tapping a spoon against a ceramic cup. Over and over. Night and day, the same tune in that cup, and I thought I'd go crazy. The first three, four days I yelled, like cursed. I did everything I could think to shut that guy up. Then one day, he stopped. Charlie straightened, as if listening. A comically hopeful expression crossed his face. And then, he said, I heard. In monotone, he resumed the anthem. I tried to cover my head, he bleated. I stuffed my ears. It was killing me. Charlie looked farcically pathetic. I broke up laughing. He was a raconteur, but also a mime. His face contained more comedy than his words. Did he ever stop? Someone finally asked. Hey, I don't know, Charlie replied, grinning. After about ten days, I was humming and tapping my foot. With that, he stroked the strings of the guitar and began to play it. Later, he told us that the fellow with the tin cup was a Section 8 military psychiatric discharge. As a prisoner in the 1950s, Charlie had helped to convert the Navy prison on Terminal Island to a standard U.S. prison. He had met crazy aides from World War II and every military conflict since. Federal prisoners are those convicted of crimes on or against federal employees or properties. Crossing state lines and the commission of a crime is federal. As are crimes committed on military bases and Indian reservations, and crimes under the jurisdiction of the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Treasury Department, the U.S. Postal Service, and so on. There were bank robbers, embezzlers, counterfeiters, racketeers, drug traffickers, gun runners, even moonshiners. <sighs> Charlie remembered a Kentucky moonshiner who claimed that the only reason he got caught was that the feds had double-crossed him. Early one morning, they had raided one of his stills and chased him up a mountain, managing to keep within yelling distance. They had begged him to stop just long enough to give them a breather. He had agreed and kept his word. They hadn't. Charlie said that this country boy was just more honest than other people. He said, Everybody laughed and thought he was a dumb rumpkin who got outrun by the feds until he went out to the track took off his shoes, 
and showed them he could outrun just about anybody. I didn't know the affinity Charlie had with such men, or that he had relatives in Ohio, West Virginia, and Kentucky, some of them genuine hill people. Our cabin smelled like weathered wood, sun-bleached canvas, patched cotton quilts, a little must, rust, stick matches, kerosene, and candle wax. It also smelled of evergreen air that we welcomed inside whenever it wasn't cold. The cumulative sense, both indoors and out, crept into my sense of self. It made me feel like something more than lonely. There were possibilities in those scents. The kitchen had a short, pudgy grandmother refrigerator, a white enameled stove with black iron burners, and lots of counter and cupboard space containing only a dented sieve and a midnight blue turkey pan. Mary had brought a 25-pound sack of soybeans, superfood, the guy at the store had told her. We filled the turkey pan with water to soak the soybeans for later cooking. Traveling through redwood country would prove educational. Two types of redwoods live in California. The giant sequoia, growing inland and generally of greater girth, and the coastal redwood, considered the world's tallest tree. Some of both have bases bigger than the average garage and make humans appear the size of chipmunks. The coastal redwood is California state tree. It is not, but should be, on the state flag beside Ursos Actos Horribilis, the grizzly bear that has long been gone from California. When the first Americans unofficially moved in to take possession of Mexican California, they called themselves, in their adversary's tongue, Los Osos. After those very present, much feared, and respected beasts, Several skirmishes and a rowdy battle later, the men raised their bear flag of victory. According to one diarist, a torn piece of petticoat on which was hurriedly drawn a bear that looked more like a Berkshire hog. The grizzly on California state flag is symbolic of that bear. A couple of miles up the coast from our cabin was a point of land and an empty lighthouse, both named for the explorer whose expedition unwittingly gave California its name. Point Cabrillo, Mary read from a limp map, named for Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. Friend of yours? Charlie queried. An explorer, she said, smiling. Some say he discovered California, and some say he named it. I've heard Charlie say only a few things regarding such discoveries, and one was this. Discovered right out from under the people who were already living there. Which is true. Europeans found an uncounted number of native tribes in California, and anthropologists at the turn of the 20th century ran to catch a glimpse of the last of them. Charlie also said, Someone said that someone said that someone told them that someone said. <laughs> He seemed to think that a large part of history was hearsay. It's people who know what they're talking about. I wanted to argue. 
It's years of research. I don't have anything against it, he said. I just look at it for what it is. He was too calm to argue with, so I argued silently and later looked it up, as if to prove his point. History tells that Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo left his Portuguese home in the early 1500s, joined the Spanish army in Cuba, and, serving under Hernan Cortes in 1521, helped to take Tenochtitlan, now in Mexico, from Montezuma and the Aztecs, and rename it New Spain. It says that 20 years later, New Spain's viceroy commissioned Cabrillo to take two ships north, charting the unmapped Pacific coast and searching for the fabled El Dorado, or Seven Cities of Gold. Here, legend and fable join hearsay and fantasy. It is recorded that Cabrillo explored the entire western coast to what is now the state of Oregon. It's also recorded that Cabrillo sailed only as far north as present-day San Francisco, where a violent storm repelled him to the south, and he died on one of the islands off Santa Barbara. Further encyclopedic research explains that Cabrillo's northward expedition never got farther north than the current San Diego Bay, and it was there that he drew his last breath. One version states that on Sunday, July 2nd, 1542, Cabrillo's party sighted California. California. Allegedly, no historical reference to the name was known until the rediscovery of a Spanish novel, The Exploits of Esplandian, a fantasy adventure published in Madrid in 1510 by Ordonez de Montalvo, or in 1500 by García Rodríguez de Montalvo. The book told of Christians in Constantinople fighting an army of black Amazons led by Queen Khalifa, or Khalifa, from the island of California. In the novel, the gold-rich island is guarded by flying beasts that can carry men into the air and drop them from unsurvivable heights. California could have been 16th century slang for the boondocks, but some historians found it plausible that Cabrillo and his crew had at least heard about the novel and made use of the name. Whether or not Cabrillo ever saw Cape Mendocino, which is 110 miles north of the town, he is credited with having named that westernmost point of California in honor of his patron, Don Antonio de Mendoza, viceroy of New Spain, and thus with naming the county and town of Mendocino. Another Mendoza, later Viceroy, muddles certainty about this point. But, and what is absolutely clear to me is why they didn't teach this in school. Critical comment on schools and books often surfaced in Charlie's conversations. While traveling one day, he sang this. If a pound of prunes costs 13 cents at half past one today, and the grocer is so bald he wears a dollar five to pay, if with every pound of tea he gives out two cut glass plates, how long before Willie falls on his roller skates? Oh, put down six and carry two. Gee, but this is hard to do. You can think and think until your brains are numb. I don't care what teacher says. I can't find that sum. I was amused, but 
wondering how to contest the subversive lyrics when he leaned in my direction. Victor Herbert, he informed me helpfully. Herbert was an Irish-American composer known for comic operettas. I'd never heard of him. <sighs> On a whim and a tip about an art show, we drove up the coast beyond Point Cabrillo and found that the whole town of Casper was for sale. All I could see of it were three dilapidated buildings that appeared never to have left the 1930s. A faded for sale sign stood post in front of a former lodge or cocktail lounge, and in the dust around it, brittle weed clumps waited like winos for another drop. Locals told us that the legendary racehorse Sea Biscuit had lived out his final days nearby, and I pictured fedoras passing through Casper. The art show consisted of a few bland landscapes, the others allegedly having been sold. But here of all places, on a warped side, on a warped boardwalk and a desolate shanty town, we ran into another ex-convict who knew Charlie. What are the odds? And didn't like him, I could tell. What an awkward coincidence. He looked like Jackknife of the Yukon with his beautiful wolf girl, and we looked just odd. My hair was haywire. I had on Mary's clothes and no makeup. The girl was magazine perfect, an expensive leather from her knee boots to the Russian fur hat pulled over curtains of satiny hair. I felt like a hillbilly next to her, or worse, middle class. There was an animal thing between Jack and Charlie, a sense of hair raising and laying back of ears. Flashes of teeth played out as smiles. They circled each other. What was Charlie doing with two women? What did Charlie think of Jack's? Was Jack laughing at Charlie? Was Charlie gloating? How primitive. How embarrassing. They were competing. Jack threw back his head, teeth to the sky. He was a cold dog, all right, and not a bit handsome. Crooked and bony at both ends. But there was something sharp and superior about him. The cruel curl of his lip, or that sniffing mu smugness. It made me think something was definitely wrong with Charlie. I already knew something was wrong with me. They exchanged a few growling attaboys and we parted. But I was so embarrassed at possibly having been perceived as a menage a trois that I couldn't see straight. As for Charlie, he was a shameless show-off. He was too confident. And he was short. He could have, he should have been taller, but he didn't stand up to his full height. I had seen that stance before. It wasn't a slouch or a slump, but the slightly rounded shoulders and ducked head of a boxer. Kathleen Maddox, Charlie's mother, was certified born in Moorhead, Kentucky in 1918. <laughs> Her parents were a railroad conductor and his strict Nazarene Christian wife. 1918, at its outset, could have announced 
the apocalypse. The number of war dead continued to rise as a lethal flu swept the globe, killing millions. But from the day Kathleen was born, war energy was redirected and America began rebuilding. Women voted in national elections for the first time and home commodities, radios and automobiles among them, became affordable and plentiful. For 11 years, American expectation and the be-all, end-all economy were on the up and up until 1929 when the stock market abruptly avalanched, taking a shocked country into a cold depression. Kathleen Maddox turned 11 in 1929 and only a few years later, she ran away from home. She told family that she'd hooked up with an older man named Colonel Scott. But by November 1934, when Charlie was born at Cincinnati General Hospital in Ohio, it was William Manson, a 24-year-old day laborer for a dry cleaning service, whose name appeared on the birth certificate. The baby's name was recorded only as Manson, barely 16. Kathleen had given her age as 18 and claimed an address on a Cincinnati street that, if city records are reliable, never existed. Shortly thereafter, for reasons unknown to me, Kathleen Maddox and her brother Luther were arrested and convicted of strong arm robbery. William Manson was out of the picture. In West Virginia, the baby Manson was renamed Charles Mills Maddox after his late grandfather and raised for six years by his maternal grandmother and a succession of relatives. He visited his mother at the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville. In a dim tackle shack in Casper, Charlie inquired of a prickly old man about the prospective sale of the town. He bought dime candy bars and emerged in the sunlight, handing one to each of us. We can't afford the two million, he said, so I got these. He liked paydays, a sweet caramel roll thickly studded with salted nuts. At night in the cabin, Mary lit a candle, some incense, and a single marijuana cigarette that we passed between us in the age-old ceremonial style. I had occasionally smoked the dried leaves of this plant with friends for at least three years and invariably received from it both heightened awareness and hallucinatory paranoia. The fixed notion that people were laughing at my stupidity blocked perception of the world around me. An acquaintance had told me that marijuana seeds could be popped in an oiled skillet like popcorn. He persuaded me to go into the kitchen to make up a badge. It was a light-hearted joke. I didn't feel that he was being malicious. But I couldn't get over the idea that I really was stupid. Because while he and other friends could sit in the living room having a good time, I was in a partial stupor, trapped in thoughts about myself. Charlie and Mary's relationship is more developed than mine. Mine is with either of them. It's as though I'm watching behind soundproof glass, unable to communicate or to understand what they're saying. I go in and out of consciousness of the scene. They are standing near a candle talking their inflated shadows enhancing them. Her posture is of open interest, 
her shoulders relaxed and neck long. He makes her laugh, and her eyes become more hugely blue and shining. I think she may be in love with him. They disappear and reappear. I try to be invisible until I could hide and sleep. If he had wanted to be alone with her, if they had wanted to be more intimate, they didn't embarrass me by showing it. I still slept in my clothes. Charlie raised an eyebrow, grinning as he looked past Mary at me one night. But he settled into his comfort and fell asleep. Apparently, he was not out to conquer. I think I wanted him too, because I was struggling. I think I was waiting for someone to jump into my mind and pull me out. On a walk the following day, I fell into the same quandary. And the patches of woods, never mind the forest, I could not see the trees. Here in the open, where a mind can expand, my view is narrowing. I'm struggling to keep a normal face, but under it, I believe I might embody all the badness, wrongness, and stupidity of the world, and I don't know how to carry it. Just guarding the secret is exhausting. In this obsessive self-consciousness, I nearly ran into Mary and Charlie, but rather than demonstrating scorn, they showed me the den of an unidentified animal. Charlie said that, with Muffet along, we were unlikely to catch a glimpse of it, and we walked on. They didn't seem to have noticed my conflict. Charlie talked to Muffet as though she understood him. She was a lustrous, intelligent animal with the sort of dog ears that teachers told us not to put at the corners of pages in our books. They expressed her character, but to him, they were beacons. He said that she sensed more, and that he was learning from her. I wondered if Mary was ever jealous of her dog's devotion to Charlie. Mary wasn't selfish, but she was private, like I was, with personal sensitivities that were sometimes mysterious. She surprised us one night kneeling beside the bed, unlatching her flute case and assembling the silver pieces with conflicting emotions on her face. The instrument was clearly a treasured and difficult friend. My father had displayed such emotions when I was six and saw him put together a clarinet that, to my excitement, he had brought from the attic. He was a fair piano player, reading from classical and popular sheet music, sometimes even singing, and I sang along. I idolized this aspect of him, but when his audience was impressed, a smirk quickly replaced his sincerity, as if to protect himself from ridicule by pretending to be joking and he never allowed himself to be taken by the music. This was true on the day he played the clarinet. His face reddened, and I felt in him a scorching humiliation. Without completing the piece, and despite our entreaties, he silently, almost angrily, put the clarinet away and I never saw it again. Kneeling, straight-backed, the candle flame sparking off her flute, 
Mary pressed a deep breath through taut lips into the instrument. She played haltingly at first, but with courage. Then, catching a muse and releasing herself, she exhaled enchanting music, lifting my mood, my spine, and my admiration of her.